So now it should work. So um, there are several topics. So I'm going to talk about first of all defining noise and uh, what artifacts you can come up with. Uh, basic filtering techniques, linear filtering mainly. Then we go into scale spaces, looking into more advanced filtering techniques. And as you are doing modifications, it's also good to verify, and I'm going to go through a couple of verification techniques and um, summarize, and then I give some introduction to the ex uh, exercises. So, uh, you have done your experiment, you're happy, uh, then you land up with a lot of data, um, gigabytes or in some cases even terabytes of data, and you don't know what to do. So the first step is to decide what you want to do, and uh, also um, the first step you need to do once you have decided could be some 3D visualization, could be characterizing some samples, um, even parameterize some process going on during the experiment. But um, common to all these uh, experiments is that the data is usually noisy to some degree and you need to clean it up before you can do any further analysis. And um, images can be in different dimensions. Uh, you can have 2Ds, traditional pictures. It can also be some radiographs or CT slices. Um, Coming from CT slice, if we go, go over to um, volumes, which actually is the purpose of CT, that you can get um, three-dimensional information. Or you can also see it as a time series of uh, radiographs or pictures, movies. It can also be observed as um, three-dimensional information. And uh, finally, if we do it really advanced, we can also do a four-dimensional. Uh, that's a topic I'm usually actually avoiding. It's a bit strange, uh, weird to uh, implement and think in four dimensions, but there, I think there are some builders uh, doing that too. But they are very memory consuming and um, I don't, don't discourage you from doing it, but it is a mind game. Uh, then you have to also decide which kind of information you want. You want to quantify uh, from the gray levels, or you want to segment structures. And the approach is how you can filter depends on how you, what you want to have in the end. And um, therefore also uh, you have to decide uh, how hard can you filter without destroying the information you want to, uh, to um, get. Sometimes it's actually an, a combination, so you use the structures to afterwards quantify information and then you can take it in, um, in a branched uh, analysis approach. So first you do segmentation, then you use the mask that you got uh, to um, extract the, quantif uh, the quantification of the grade levels. And uh, as I already mentioned, uh, measurements are rarely perfect. So say you wanted to do, this is a very simple image, uh, you wanted to do an image of a cylinder, a CT image, and um, this is what you ideally would see. Very sharp, no noise, and uh, no artifacts. But when you put it through the measurement system, first of all, you get some optical blurring. Uh, then you can have noise, you can have uncorrelated, you can have textured noise. And then comes a bunch of artifacts. Typically for um, tomography is that you get ring artifacts. And you can also get line artifacts if you have uh, spots in uh, projection. And afterwards, the measured image looks pretty ugly. So um, you have to um, uh, clean this uh, out, and um, that is what we are going to talk about now. The whole processing chain is that you have acquired your image, do some enhancement, today's lecture, segmentation will come later, and also post-processing and evaluation, which is the final product you want to have. Uh, it could be, for example, water retention curves, it could be material distributions, um, or other water distribution, that's a fuel cell. And um, that is the information you will get in the end. <clears throat> so, going to the noise, we have different kinds of noise. 
um, depending on where it comes from. Um, you have gaussian noise, salt and pepper noise, you have some structured noise. And um, this doesn't uh, depend on what happens, well actually the last one does. Um, the first two don't depend on um, the neighbor pixels, so they are really uncorrelated between each other. Uh, if you have a structured noise, there is a connection between uh, neighbor pixel, pixels uh, in this noise structure. Typical distributions that we come across is the Gaussian distribution. Very popular because it's easy to uh, um, work with. Uh, then we have Poisson noise, which is more the reality for um, um, essentially all photon counting or event counting um, techniques. It's a multiplicative uh, noise type, so um, the noise variance increases with the noise average. Um, here's an example. Uh, you can show first um, sine curve with the Gauss noise. We can see that the noise amplitude is constant throughout the whole um, curve. But if you take Poisson noise, you can see that at the high amplitude here, you have much higher noise amplitude than you have at the lower amplitude. And uh, well, I try to extract the noise component only, and you can see that it's kind of a uniform uh, distribution across this curve. And in this case, it tapers off towards this area here. The salt and pepper noise is a special kind of noise, so it's a very single event. Usually it's a kind of outlayer noise. So you only have a spot which has intensity that runs out of the normal image. And um, there are different ways of defining it. Here is one that you can have a plus minus uh, salt and pepper. Sometimes you have only zero one salt and pepper noise, and, um, well, which driving um, distribution you use for it is depends on, uh, on the model. Here I use a uniform distribution. So if it is within certain boundaries, it generates a spot event. If it's not, then um, you don't get a spot. The structured noise, um, is mostly when you have um, uh, some kind of particle hitting a detector, there is a little flash which um, distributes, smears out over several pixels. So that is what you can see in um, um, if the in the different detectors. So, for example, I, I myself do neutron imaging, and um, it's a two-step um, conversion approach. So the spots where each neutron hits the detector are pretty big, and we see often this kind of structured noise in our images. Um, sometimes you could even have some um, oriented noise, so it would be that you have a slanted noise kernel, and that would give the lower one. Not so common in, um, in detectors, I would say, but could be. Uh, maybe during some um, development phase. Here are two different examples at uh, different uh, noise levels. So I took the same sample, exposed it at uh, 50 milliseconds and using 10 seconds, and you can see that this one is clearly noisier than this one, and it's more clear even if you look at the profile I dra uh, drag here, that it's very difficult to distinguish the steps that you actually can see by eye, uh, but in this profile it's very difficult to distinguish it. And that's a problem that you will have also later when you want to segment the data, that the noisier the data is, the harder it is to make a clear decision, is this class A or is this class B? Uh, so you, you would like to have something where you have clearly distinguished um, levels and um, that makes it much easier to segment. Um, to measure the signal strength, we use a metric called signal-to-noise ratio, which essentially is um, the average intensity in a region divided by the signal, uh, standard deviation of the same region. And uh, here you can see what it looks like when you have different signal-to-noise ratio. Here I have infinite, no noise added. Uh, here I have signal-to-noise ratio 5, 2, and 1. And 1 
starts getting pretty tricky to see actually what it is. You can see the main structures, but uh, you can't see the fine details. So they're really buried in the noise. And here is a plot, because um, uh, when you have Poisson statistics, which you get from the detectors, then there is a relation that the signal to noise ratio is actually square root of the intensity, average intensity. And if you do an experiment, as I have done here, so this is actually experimental data, and you can see that um, you have signal to noise ratio is actually following this um, square root of lambda law. <coughs> then we have some uh, artifacts in the acquisition. Uh, one is the rings. They, you can't usually avoid them in most CT experiments, and there are many algorithms to get rid of them. The origin of the, um, of the ring artifact is that there is one pixel which is locked to a single value, and that's, by the way, how many of you have know how a, um, data is acquired and reconstructed when you have CT data? Not so many. Okay, so the principle when you do an acquisition a CT acquisition is that you have a sample, um, but you can only get radiographs that looks through um, the sample and you get a projection of it. You can't get the three-dimensional information. So what you have to do is actually make an images on different directions and then use a reconstruction algorithm that give you the three-dimensional data. And if then there is a single spot marked on each pixel uh, in the um, of these uh, many projections. Um, that will produce a line in the so-called sinogram. And the sinogram is called like this because if you have a spot somewhere in the image, observe it from different ways, it would actually draw, whoops, not a nice sine curve, um, uh, draw a sine curve in the sinogram. So if you have some sample like this, it would probably create some sinogram that looks like this with some other stuff in between. Now, the ring artifacts, they come from the fact that you have one single position which remains all throughout the acquisition, and when you reconstruct, that one turns into a circle, and then you get the ring artifacts. Lines that you also can get in the reconstruction, um, they are very frequent. Um, in the neutron imaging, not so much in X-ray, um, is that you have a single spot. And when a, you have a single spot in the sinogram, that will turn out as a line in the reconstruction. And if you have many, then it can look like this one, which you have on the slides. You can probably not distinguish individual lines, but this is actually so noisy due to, to um, spots and line artifacts. The spots I will show you how to uh, get rid of uh, during uh, uh, in uh, one of the following slides, and um, it's not so difficult actually. Let me see. It doesn't want to continue. Okay, and then we have also numerical artifacts, something that is introduced through your computations. It can be during acquisition, can be during filtering, and it looks usually unnatural. So you can really distinguish, oh, here is something wrong. I have done something wrong in my acquisition or in my calculations. So I need to actually go back and debug. So you should avoid having that kind of trying to clean out that kind of noise, but rather go back to the algorithms and check what you have done. Oh, this one doesn't want to work anymore. Strange. Okay, so I have to do it like this. Um, then we have um, the exercises in this course will be done using Python, and there are many packages uh, in Python that we can use. Uh, one general purpose um, package is uh, NumPy. Then we have Scikit Image, uh, SciPy. Uh, General also has some image processing, uh, OpenCV, 
But um, let's start with these packages, and then we have matplotlib for doing plotting and visualization. And a couple of uh, functions that are useful um, to begin with, relating to what we I have shown you right now, are different random number generators. Um, the purpose of generating random numbers is that you, then you can simulate and verify your performance of your uh, processing. So you have Gaussian, you have Uniform, Poisson, and I think 10 other distributions that you can also define. Um, but I just list those now, right now. Then on the statistics side, you ha also have um, uh, mean, variance, standard deviation. You can also compute the minimum and maximum of the data, and median and rank. So these are operations that are available in these packages. And now I just wanted to show you, let's see if I can get that one running, uh, not the right one. Uh, so, how many of you have used Python before? That's good. Um, so you probably also know Jupyter. Um, so what you have to do is first set up some um, playground. So we have load numpy, we know, uh, load uh, matplotlib, and scipy. So that is the frame I'm going to use here. And then you execute by pressing Shift Enter, and it's loaded. And then I would like, to, oops, let's see that one. Um, then I would like to here to play with some different noise generators. So here I actually realized the different um, random generators: uh, normal, uniform, and Poisson. And then I'm showing the results of them. And uh, going in here, you have some different images to see what they look like. We are going to do this afterwards in the exercise. I just wanted to show a little bit how, how it can work. Um, ah, now it works. Okay, so now we have the noise. We also have, uh, so, and I want to um, look at the filter techniques. So the first techniques we want to do is define what is a filter. Um, so in principle, it's an operation that enhances the wanted information and preferably also suppresses the unwanted information. And um, then it should also not and modify the information so that it actually gets, uh, gets misle misleading. Um, general book on that topic is uh, Bernd Jähne. I think the newest one is from 2005. Could be that he has done a newer one more recently. Uh, typical filter characteristics are low-pass filters and high-pass filters, and they are kind of the opposite of each other. So if you have an original image, with these um, uh, two main features that there is a slow variation and there is a rapid variation. And then the low pass filter would ideally only show uh, the slow variations while the uh, high pass filter would take out the slow variations and only show the rapid variations. So these are the two main filter characteristics that we're talking about. Um, in between there is also band pass and band stop filters um, to focus on special um, uh, spatial frequencies in the data. Uh, usually um, the first type of filter you come across are the linear filters which are a convolution in 2D or 3D or as many dimensions you like. Um, so we are using the convolution interval um, with an image and a filter kernel and this filter kernel then decides what kind of uh, characteristics your filter will have. Uh, the Gauss filter is, uh, no, let's start with the mean and box filter. So this is the most simple filter you can come up with. It's just a uniform uh, filter kernel. In this case, I show 5x5 five five filter kernel. So it's the local average um, in this image. 
on each pixel. Uh, the Gauss filter has uh, a weighting function added to it, so you get more focus on the central pixel around the kernel and less focus uh, towards the edges of the filter kernel. And here is an uh, example of what happens at different signals and noise ratios uh, with uh, a mean filter. Uh, mean filter has many names. Um, uniform, box, mean, so they are all the same filter. Um, depending on which literature you're reading, they use different names. I think in the Python, they call it uniform kernel. <coughs> Uh, so, starting out with no noise and then increasing the filter kernel size, you can see that it gets more and more blurry. So, down here I have 7x7 seven seven filter kernel. And all the fine details here around the rib cage are more or less completely blurred out. So, you wouldn't use that one on a, on a, a high signal to noise ratio image. On the other hand, if you start then um, decreasing the signal to noise ratio, you start seeing here that uh, it's getting harder and harder to see things in the unfiltered one. And by applying the filter here, well, it looks pretty good. Then you probably can already start doing some decent segmentation. And um, by incre uh, increasing the noise component, you see that it's getting harder and harder. And here, I wouldn't even try to do some kind of segmentation still. On the other hand, with the 7x7 filter, you can probably at least get the, the main structure of, of, the, of the sample out. So it depends on how strong uh, the noise is, which uh, kernel size you would use. And in principle, the convolution is, well, probably first year math. Um, but uh, anyway, it's in principle, you take out the pixels in a neighborhood, sum them up, divide by number of pixels, and then you get the value which you place on this, and then you just run through the imaging um, for each pixel and see what, uh, and uh, get the filter effect. Um, then if you would have a Gauss in the kernel, then you would actually multiply each of these numbers with a filter kernel weight. One thing that is interesting for some uh, linear filters is that they are separable, and the purpose of it is that when you have larger kernels, and in particular if you have a large kernel in three dimensions, it can take some while to uh, compute it. <coughs> and uh, some filtered uh, kernels, like the Gaussian and the Box, uh, they can actually be separated into X and Y, or the principal direction, so if you have a three dimension, you would also have a set direction, and then convolve them with smaller pieces, one after the other, and that will give at least theoretically the same result. Um, due to numerical limitations, there will be a slight difference, but um, you would have a speed up gain by doing like this. So, in a simple case that you would have a three by three, then you would have in the full kernel size nine multiplications and eight additions. Uh, if you were split it, you would have six multiplications and four additions, which saves you some time. But the real benefit comes when you go up into 3D, where you would have, um, um, in this three by three case, 27 multiplications and 27, uh, 26 additions, um, would reduce into nine multiplications and six additions. So, there you can have a real gain if you go onto, onto 3D data. And if you got, go to even larger kernels, like 5x5 five five or 7x7, seven seven, then it runs away in uh, very many, and this one stays pretty low. So you have a quadratic relation here, and you have a linear relation here. Um, so here is the example of the Gauss filter, how to split it. So you can have one kernel only operating on the x-coordinates, and one operating only on the y coordinate. The medium filter is another option. It's not a linear filter, but it has similar um, characteristics as the low pass filters. Um, and um, here it's about taking out the pixel neighborhood, sort all the pixels, take the medium value, and place that in here. 
It has some very attractive features, like it can very well reject outlayers, but um, if you have no outlayers, actually a Gauss filter or a, a box filter would produce better results, uh, better than noise reduction. Um, the, another advantage of the medium filter is it's more gentle to edges. So when you're close to an edge in the image, uh, so rapid change in intensity, then um, the medium filter can be more gentle than uh, the box filter. So here's an example. Uh, I add 10% salt and pepper noise, and I think it's more better visible on your screens. Um, if I do a medium filtering, essentially all these spots are gone, while the, um, the box filtered still has um, some noisy effects left. And the reason is that the spot is an outlier that puts a high weight uh, on, the neighbor, uh, on the neighborhood, and then you get still some remaining information, and that is what you see here. On the other hand, if you have white Gaussian noise, uh, then the difference is marginal, and uh, theory says that the medium filter should even be worse than the mean filter. I think there, there is a factor 2 over pi difference in sigma to noise ratio you can get between uh, medium and, uh, and mean. So, an example. Um, as I promised before, I, I would like to show you how to get rid of these spots that I mentioned here, but produce the uh, line artifacts. And um, we have a lot of um, spots in neutron images. You can see them here. Um, that's actually caused by gamma photons that hit the detector after interacting. So the gamma sp um, photons that are generated when the neutrons interact with a sample, and then you get these uh, spots in, in the data. And um, we have them a lot, and we have to clean them mostly. So there are different ways of doing it. Uh, one would be to apply a low-pass filter, as you saw before. Local filter is not very good at um, uh, removing outliers. The medium filter will remove the outliers, but it actually is applied to the whole image, so we, you get blurring throughout the image, and you don't want that either. So the approach that I'm going to talk about is detecting, identifying where you have the spots, and then clean only those portions. And uh, the algorithm to do it is uh, consists of several steps. So you have the original with your medium filter, and then you subtract them and get the absolute uh, difference. And then you can already see where you have spots in the image. And you identify these spots by uh, looking at outlayers. So you set a threshold saying that everything that is stronger than this threshold should be considered a spot and that will be replaced by something. And what is it replaced by is the medium, and afterwards you will get a cleaned image. Parameters you can play with are the width of the medium filter. That has an impact on how, you can, how big uh, spots. You see some of the spots are pretty big uh, around here. Um, and the other one is threshold, where what should be considered being a spot. And playing with those two, you can clean out pretty much already. So here's an example showing um, what it looks like when you apply different filter types on, um, on the same cutout from the image. So we have the original. You can see here that there are some outliers. Applying the box, you see that it's yeah, smearing it out, but it doesn't really bring much. The medium actually takes out the, essentially the spots, but you can also see that there is a blurring compared to the original. And then by using this cleaning algorithm, you have got rid of the spots and maintain all the fine details in the image. And here you can see the differences, what they take out. And um, here are some things that ImageJ, if you know uh, ImageJ from previous um, courses or um, homeworks or something, 
um, has two ways of doing it. One is the speckle, which is a plain medium, uh, don't use it. And the other one would be remove out layers, which actually applies some similar algorithm to what I have shown here. So now we have looked at uh, removing all the rapid changes, so the, the fine grain noise, but, and that would be the low pass filters. Um, the next step would be to look at um, high pass information. And um, then we're talking about rapid information. Um, uh, and typical high pass filters we have are graded filters of different types. And they're usually used for edge detection because an edge is a very rapid change so that we give a high signal in the high pass um, filter. And here are some examples using um, a derivative um, filter uh, where you have typical differential uh, style. This one is a very special one. It was defined by uh, Jena. It's optimized to be uh, delivering perf uh, the best uh, angular uh, response in any direction. Uh, if you just use um, uh, minus one, one, then you would have some preference um, in the orientations. And uh, by using this kernel, you have the best um, orientation response. But anyway, um, looking at this, you can see that uh, applying a filter, you get a lot of vertical lines because that is what the filter is set to be sensitive to. And uh, here you look at the, the other direction and you see all the horizontal lines. And typically is that you have one positive um, valued uh, response and one negative valued. So when you approach, you can see here, um, you have the, the bright and the dark. So that's rising edge and falling edge. They give different signs, which is to be expected by the derivative. And then um, these two previous ones, they were only sensitive to separate direct, um, individual directions. And then there are other ways that if you want to detect the edges, you should possibly apply uh, have Laplacian, which still has signs, which can tell you which um, direction the edges approach. Or you can have a Sobel, which actually just identify here is an edge and that's it. So it only has positive values. So you don't see from, from what direction it comes. But it's very popular for detecting edges. So, um, yeah, let's take this one and then have a break. As you may have noticed, I'm talking sometime, have been talking about spatial uh, frequencies, rapid and slow uh, changes. And um, now we come to using the Fourier transform because we are talking about um, frequency information in, uh, in the images when we're talking about these filters. And um, first of all, a very quick introduction to a Fourier transform and Fourier space is that you can, any signal in real space, you can actually describe with a set, a sum of different um, oscillations and depending on how many oscillations you use, the better you can um, describe um, your signal. So here I have a very sharp pulse. And first, I just use two harmonics. It can give the main shape of it. But if I then add more and more uh, harmonics, so frequency components, then you can see that it follows better and better in the shape of this uh, pulse. And um, now we can actually do filtering by identifying which frequencies um, are used for different um, features in the image. And um, well, here comes the transform, the typical um, Fourier transform integrals. I'm not going to describe them. Um, but this is just the analytical uh, equations. But in reality, you use the fast Fourier transform in, in the software. And um, that is available in, I would say, any numerical package. You also have it in, um, in Python. And uh, here are some interesting features in um, the Fourier space. Is one is that there's an additive uh, function, uh, function here. 
So if you have signals A and B and add them, that's the same as you would take the Fourier transform of signal A plus signal B. So here I have a, a slow change, gives you two peaks uh, in the um, Fourier domain, and here is a rapid one, and I get um, two peaks a little bit more apart because there are higher frequencies. Summing them would give something like this, and then you would get two peaks like that. Another very interesting thing is the convolution, and that's one of the main reasons why I'm taking it up, is that convolution in Fourier space is just a multiplication between the kernel and the image, Fourier transformed. And that is a very interesting feature. Um, the reversed one is maybe less used, in that you have multiplication in a spatial domain would correspond to a convolution in the frequency domain. Um, so to get rid of filter, uh, get, them, get rid of noise using the Fourier transform, um, you have the signal plus some additive white noise, looks like this, you have image plus noise, and it looks pretty ugly. Um, looking at the Fourier transforms of them, you have a lot of information for the image, but the noise, if it's white noise, it's just constant level in the Fourier space. It's distributed uniformly over all frequencies. And if you add them, you can see that, oh, there is only a little peak here and you have the noise background. So maybe you can get an idea now uh, how to get rid of, uh, of the noise. And um, we want to actually suppress the noise without destroying too many relevant image features. Um, I didn't continue. Okay. Um, in principle, you would just take, um, make a mask that you apply to to this image, uh, to the to the spectrum, and multiply by the mask, and then inverse Fourier transform, and then you would have the filter effect. <clears throat> Another interesting thing. Yes. How do you know what mask to apply? Uh, one would be, oops, um, one would be a very simple one, simple thresholding. You, you'd go out here, um, because at the high frequencies, uh, you make first the assumption you have um, white noise, that would be a constant level. You go out here in some corner at the high frequencies, because usually there is very little energy in the high frequencies. Mm -hmm. Evaluate what um, level you have here and then you set that as a threshold. And then you can create a, a mask based on that, or making some weighting function based on that. I will show you an example, not on this, but similar uh, thing um, in a few slides. Okay. And what, what about, for example, square, uh, taking the square, does that help? Because then you like make features bigger and the ones that are smaller, there are, there are techniques like that too, actually. What they're doing is um, um, they separate the, um, the face, so it's complex valued information. So what they do is uh, separating uh, face and um, amplitude mm -hmm. and um, filter only the amplitude part and then put them together again. That's one way that has been done. And that's actually already pretty interesting. Another one um, which I've seen is to take the logarithm of the amplitude and combine them again. And that also gives some interesting filter effects. Um, so there are different ways of doing it. The very simple um, is just that you make a circle in the middle. This is what my pass band is. The other one is stop band. Very simple. Um, you can even go into um, um, Wiener filtering, where you start looking at um, signal compared to noise and uh, trying to optimize, getting optimal filters in the Fourier domain. Um, that one I can't give you an example of right now. Um, the other thing which is interesting with the Fourier and transform is that it's orientation sensitive. In particular, the 
two-dimensional. Uh, this, I think you need to look at your screens, uh, but in principle you have a spot here and a spot here, that where the distance tells me the frequency and the orientation of the spots uh, tells me the orientation of the line. So in this case you have two spots like this, here you have two spots slanted, here you have the spots really vertically oriented, and here you have the spots uh, also again slanted. So with that you can actually also extract um, ripple information in the images and um, here's an example doing that applied on real data. Uh, we had uh, some stripes in the projection data. You see these stripes and they produce unwanted artifacts in the reconstructed data afterwards. Uh, looking at the Fourier transform maybe not look really obvious, uh, but there is some kind of structure in this direction, and that corresponds to the tilt of, um, of these lines here. So what I did was to apply a filter kernel, looking like this, I tweaked and tuned and shaped and so on, to get the kernel that was cutting out the information that I don't want and left the rest um, more or less unharmed. So after applying this filter, I could get rid of some of the stripes and the effect of applying it is uh, what you can see here. This cloudy effect in, um, in the background is caused by these uh, stripes. And after the filtering, when I reconstructed the data, I got that one instead. So there is uh, actually a possibility to remove stripes and uh, gain from that after. So, now we come to some more um, Python functions, and then I think it's about time for break. And I can show you also... Um, nope, let's see. Ah, there it is, yeah. So, let's go into this one. So, here I have prepared the different filters. Uh, Gaussian, uniform, median, and convolution with some arbitrary kernel. And uh, I'll apply them. And then you can see what the effect is of using these filter kernels. Uh, I, will actually, I, I will give you this uh, notebook afterwards or send them to Kevin so he can upload them um, so you can play with it yourself also. And that would be the end of first part.